Saints Row is a series defined by other games, for better or for worse. The earlier games, Saints Row 1 and 2, were defined by its similarities to the Grand Theft Auto franchise. It's very apparent where Saints Row draws its influences. Initially, the game just looks like a carbon copy of the Grand Theft Auto series. Whilst the later games, Saints Row 3, 4 and beyond, were defined by trying to move as far away from GTA as possible. The bus is counting on us! You think I don't know? When a series identity is based on people's comparisons to a completely different game, if you're always trying to escape the shadow of something else, how do you even create something unique? There are a few ways. You. You're next. For example, there are a couple of very important features that are crucial to what makes a Saints Row game. Saints Row should always have an insane level of character customization. Do you want to create something resembling a human being or some hideous eldritch <laughs> abomination to haunt your dreams at night? The most important distinction, however, was the tone. GTA is considered to be a gritty crime simulator within a free open world. Oftentimes, there is a problem with these open world games where the game's developer faced the issue of wanting their main character to start out as a relatively innocent person. Ah, I promised myself I wouldn't kill people here. The cutscenes may show your main character saying he doesn't want to kill anyone, but in the actual gameplay, just before this cutscene took place, he murdered 20 innocent people. Initially with Saints Row 1, Volition, the developers of the game, went down a very similar path with a similar grounded tone. However, after gamers realised you could actually steal car, the game was promptly labelled as a GTA clone and was quickly dismissed by most. When Volition was presented with this criticism, they of course didn't like it. They had worked hard on a game they were incredibly passionate about, and all their hard work was being discredited because of its similarities to GTA. So naturally, they had to come up with a solution. To see success with Saints Row, they simply had to fix this issue. And so, they did fix this issue, and they struck gold. That's my name and they know it. The home of the go go forever be a focus. who adopts a more wacky and light-hearted tone compared to GTA. I am the man whose property you stole. Oops. <laughs> the total seriousness of GTA 4, which was released at the time, it is was a completely different experience to Saints Row 2's approach of total fun and player freedom. Saints Row 2 adopts this wacky style and absolutely runs with it in the best ways possible. Hey buddy, wanna help? I just wanna point out that if you didn't know about this already, Volition actually released an absolute gem of a trailer for Saints Row 2 back in the day, making fun of the activities in GTA 4. Would you rather go bowling or steal a septic truck and spray loads of sewage on pedestrians? The key to Saints Row 2's brilliance, however, is including these wacky moments to separate it from GTA, without letting it affect the serious tone of the story Volition wanted to tell. You could be spraying human waste on buildings in one moment, and in the next, you could be forced to mercy kill your young apprentice after he was tortured by a rival gang. To begin with, let me just give you a quick rundown of Saints Row 1's story. Saints Row 1 primarily centers around your gang, the Third Street Saints originating from the neighborhood of Saints Row. You, the player, join up with the gang after they save you from a shootout between the other gangs. It's clear from this interaction that these gangs are a big problem and should be dealt with to make sure the streets are safe. Julius, the leader, takes you under his wing and throughout the entire game, you become a stronger member of the Saints, becoming more and more ruthless in your pursuit of taking back the city from the other gangs. It is at this game's end where you have defeated all the other city's gangs, finally making the city safe again with the strength of the Saints watching over the streets. It is here where Julius decides ultimately that there is still one more gang that needs to be defeating to finally make the streets safe from all gang warfare. The Saints themselves. Themselves. He blows you up aboard a yacht, the last lead of the Saints, seemingly killing you for good, truly defeating every gang in the city and putting a stop to gang warfare in Stillwater. And this is where Saints Row 2 begins. You'll never guess who's awake. You're shitting me. Come see for yourself. How long has it been? Years. I stopped keeping track a while ago. 
The main character, who I will refer to as the boss, wakes up from a coma inside a prison, not knowing how long he's been unconscious for. You wake up to a prison doctor taking your bandages off, and before this poor doctor's eyes, your face shifts and changes like some hideous monster as you customize your character. You naturally have your regular customization options like with any other character creator, such as face shape, hair, beard, skin tone, and other basic features. However, Sintro 2 goes a step further. First and foremost, you have three unique voices for each gender. My favorite is, of course, the British accent. What I wouldn't do for a decent pint around here. Secondly, you can change almost every visual aspect of your character's personality. From your character's walking and facial animations, to your fighting style and taunts and compliments. These have next to no change in regards to the gameplay. But it does give your boss its own unique style and completely separates it from anyone else. Which, ultimately, is the most important part of a character customization feature anyway. From here, a young man named Carlos is wheeled into the prison infirmary. Is it really you? He honestly looks like he's not much older than the average age of a Fortnite gamer. But he tells you he was aware of your reputation from the first game and had gotten himself purposely stabbed just to meet you in the infirmary. Come on, I just got myself shanked so I could get a chance to talk to you. Doesn't that show I'm loyal? Shows that you're dumb enough to let yourself get stabbed. It is clear from this interaction that Carlos is very, very naive. However, it is clear that the boss himself is also somewhat naive in his own way. You need me. Hell I do, I got the sights. I'm sure you do. What's that supposed to mean? He believes he has been unconscious for just a few weeks and wants to get back to the saints. Unknowingly to the boss, the saints have long since disbanded in the years he's been in the coma. He's got no strength, no backup, and no one to help him anymore. Carlos informs the boss of a plan to escape the prison island complex, and he agrees. It's clear both will need each other in the current moment to make it out of the prison alive. All right, let's get out of here. So, literally after five minutes after you wake up, you begin tearing your way through the prison to the escape. Fun fact, there's a hidden armory if you go down the other path than what the game tells you to go down, and it has some really good late game weapons you can access early on. These little secret areas are everywhere around the map, and whilst not all of them will have weapons like this one does, many will feature small easter eggs or collectibles, and most importantly, they really do make the city feel that much more alive. And speaking of the city, what a city it is. There are a few cities in gaming that feel alive as still water, even to this day. From the college district where the students are making their way to class with their overpriced textbooks in hand, to the slums and projects where the homeless litter the streets surrounded by trash, every single district feels unique. And given the small map, it makes the water feel absolutely massive. It's an illusion for sure, but it's definitely a good one. The NPCs will also react to each other in appropriate ways based on their occupation. You will see elderly couples hugging each other on park benches in the wealthier districts where it's safer, and fights breaking up between gangs attacking each other, and police trying to keep order on the streets in the more dangerous areas of the city. It makes the city feel alive, and for a 2008 game, it really is impressive. For the city of the future, it appears we need to look into the past. Jokes aside, from here you steal a boat and head towards the main city. On your way there, you see the old neighborhood of Saint Tro, where the saints had originated from. That's the row? It is now. Jesus, when did this happen? When Ultra got involved. It's been completely changed by the Ultor Corporation, an ultra-rich conglomerate working on reducing crime and investing into revitalizing areas once stricken with poverty. If there is anything that represents the decline in the Saints' power as a gang, it's how Saints Row has been completely transformed. It's clear from here on out, you're a very small fish in a very big, unrecognizable pond. My advice is to just keep your head down. I say you just go buy a beer and soak up as much information as you can. Thanks, Carlos. Naturally, of course, as anyone would do after being locked in prison with a bunch of men for five years, you head down to the strip club. From here, whilst you listen to the news on the TV, you find out that Johnny Gat, an old high-ranking member of the original Saint, is on trial to determine whether he gets sent to death row. Probably for the multiple homicides he caused in the first game, but honestly, I think it's more than likely for the cauliflower trim on his head. The boss, of course, heads down to the court straight away and kills everybody inside to free Johnny from potentially getting the electric chair. This is our first encounter with Gap for five entire years. You packing anything else? Just some rubbers. Guess I hit a nerve. 
Everyone knows first impressions are crucial and Gath absolutely sticks the landing. There's no statute of limitations for murder. Why the fuck not? You already planning on giving me the chair. You think I'd give a shit about you not liking me? Fuck off. Curious if you can keep your cavalier attitude when 2,000 volts are running through your body. Oh yeah? And I'm curious if you can keep acting like a douchebag when I shove that gavel up your ass. Johnny is an absolute brick wall for the Saints. In Saints Row 1, he was portrayed as hot-headed and brash, and oftentimes this would get him into massive trouble. In Saints Row 2, he hasn't changed much in that regard. What, we don't get to blow shit up in public? But his time in prison has matured him a lot. It's a very good thing he's on the other side. But the best thing above all else is that he is your best bro. After escaping the courthouse with Gat, you head to his long-term girlfriend's house, Aisha, to lay low. This will be the perfect place to hide, as Aisha, who was once a famous R&B artist, had faked her death in the first game. It's very unlikely the police will find you here. You quickly get to work planning on how you'll build the Saints back up from scratch. And that can't wait until after dinner? No. no. With the first course of action finds at the base of operations for the gang. So they wipe out the homeless bum occupants of an abandoned building and make the base in the underground section. Despite the fact it looks like the average Brazilian cartel hovel in the favela, this place will do for now. You also get access to your first crib in the game, the Red Light District Apartment. You will be able to purchase a number of these cribs throughout the game, each offering some great utilities. You can obviously access and equip your weapons and clover items, which is expected. However, you can also watch any cutscene and replay any mission from your crib. It's rewind time. This is genuinely great. This honestly should be standard in any open world game similar to Saints Row 2. Being able to relive and re-enjoy your favorite moment in the game without having to start all over again is great. And I wish other games would implement this feature too. Finally, the thing to mention with cribs, each crib has multiple unique customization options to buy to change the visual design of your apartment, from the furniture and the overall aesthetic. A lot of the options are obviously basic and superficial, aside from granting you extra XP when you buy the upgrades, but it's an extra detail that didn't need to be implemented. They could have easily just given you one house to use like other games do, one that you obviously can't customize, but it is great to see that they have included it and it gives you something fun to spend your money on. Now, we can quickly jump from this and begin to talk about one of Saints Row 2's greatest and most famous strengths. Saints Row 2 has the greatest clothing customization out of any urban open world game. A game from 2008 is still unrivaled when it comes to the sheer number of options you have when it comes to clothing options. Saints Row 2 features an incredibly robust clothing system, where other games in the genre give you basic stock options of upper body, lower body shoes and accessories. Saints Row 2 has a layered clothing system, where you could buy an undershirt, then place an overshirt on top of that, then a jacket, then maybe a backpack on top of all of that. This also applies for your lower body too, with underwear, socks, shoes, pants and belts being their own unique categories. Beyond even this, there are multiple variants of every item of clothing, with some for example having stripes, spots or two-tone and beyond. You can also choose how you wear certain items too, like having your jacket or shirt open or closed or with a tie, and then tucked or untucked, and then smaller things like your hat leaning in almost any direction you want. Simply put, the amount of customization options you have in this game is genuinely insane, and nothing to this date in this genre has come close. Oh, oh, wait, wh where was I? Oh yeah, the story. Now that you and Gat have established a safe house to build the gang out of, you need to build the gang itself. We can't really run a gang if we don't have, you know, a fucking gang. After doing a bit of spring cleaning, you head out to find three lieutenants to manage taking down the three ruling gangs. The Ronin, Sons of Sarmody, and the Brotherhood. Carlos, the guy who helped you escape from prison, is a no-brainer. The Brotherhood, I'm on it. That just leaves two more. You find Sean D, the local village bike who has slept with half of Stillwater. Jokes aside, she is extremely street smart and has intimate knowledge on the Sons of Sarmody's operations. It's gotta be them. Fuck you, say. It's cool. I, I got this. Finally, you find Pierce and recruit him. Pierce often tries to make use of the free brain cells he has to solve problems. Now this is what we need, some drive-by music. 
and despite him not being the smartest member of the gang, he makes up for it through sheer hard work, and he becomes an incredible asset to the team. He will be good for the Ronin. It's our time now. Let's get this shit started. I will go into more depth into each gang in their own sections, but for now, we're at a bit of a crossroads. From here, you can tackle the three gangs in any order you so choose. My preferred approach is tackling the Brotherhood first, followed by the Ronin, then the Sons of Sarmody. So this is the order we'll tackle the story here. Where's your crew then? I don't need one. I could kill you right now. No, you couldn't. Ooh. You're hard. The Brotherhood storyline is an absolute slugging match between the leader of the Brotherhood, Mero, and the boss of the Saints. With each leader trading blow for blow, leading to the depths of people they both care about. The Brotherhood, when it comes to the main character, is all about teaching him the consequences of being a leader. The entire Brotherhood campaign is a pure war of attrition, both tactically and emotionally. Oh, and um, the Brotherhood also like tattoos and big trucks. Get some of your freedom back with this month's truck, man. The Brotherhood mission campaign, oddly enough, starts with Carlos letting you know that Mero, the leader of the Brotherhood, has a deal for you to prevent any potential fighting. Mero is already aware of your reputation from Saint Row 1. He knows just how strong of an opponent the boss and Gat would be. And he is trying to prevent the people he cares about from dying in a war that doesn't need to start in the first place. He genuinely seems like an intelligent and considerate leader. Mero is the only gang leader to make this type of offer in the game, and I think it says a lot about his intelligence in regards to running his gang and picking his fights well. You, Carlos and Mero escape the caverns and lose the police, then head to the Brotherhood's hideout, a warehouse in the Stillwater docks. You get to meet the Brotherhood's main members as you walk in. Hey, aren't you the guitarist for the Feed Dogs? Don't encourage him. Listen, lady, you guys met at one of my concerts, so I don't want to hear it. The first impression you get from the group is that they feel like a genuine family. You actually feel like you can probably like these people, despite them being an opposing gang. Which is strange, but oddly welcoming. As Carlos walks in, Jessica makes fun of him with a racist joke. You know, you remind me of my own house clean. This joke at the expense of Carlos seems to knock his confidence quite a bit, which of course is quite worrying. Carlos is already naive, but right now, he's been placed in a serious position of power within the Saints, and his reaction to this harmless joke, where any other hardened gang member would never have been hit by something so small, is a pretty worrying sign. The Brotherhood is about to come into something big, and I think the Saints are going to want to get in on the ground floor. So what's the offer? 2080. I'm assuming I'll get the 80. Yeah, sure you do. You really expect me to take 20 and say thanks? Your hands and fucking knees. Is this a joke? I used to own still. Used to is right. Now you're a has-been with some burn scars. Barrow's offer is not enough for the boss. In his mind, the saints are still the kings of Stillwater, which Mero rightfully points out isn't true anymore. After they're not able to come to an agreement, the boss chooses to leave, and it seems war is inevitable. Let's go, Carlos. After this, however, Surprise, the boss decides it's time to attack the Brotherhood. He begins by ordering a Brotherhood Lieutenant, Donnie, to blow up a few of the Brotherhood's trucks. Then, we drop Donnie off at the Brotherhood HQ for Mero to deal with. In the following mission, we meet up with Carlos to discuss intel he's gathered on the Brotherhood. What you got for me? Nothing. Are you shit, me? Tried everything I could. What was I supposed to do? Try harder. The boss is disappointed naturally. It's clear Carlos isn't ready to be in the position he's in, but the boss has a weak spot for him and wants to see him succeed. Carlos, I like it, I do, but you've got a lot to learn about being a lieutenant. After seeing the nuclear plant across the river, the boss has a spark of inspiration. However, before leaving, he tells Carlos he's going to make him into a gangster if it kills him, with Carlos looking worried, showing he may potentially be reconsidering what he's doing with the Saints altogether. The boss takes a boat over and steals the nuclear waste from the power plant and sneaks it into Mero's tattoo parlor, which works extremely well. Baby? With that, we go into the following mission, Red Asphalt. Carlos, where the fuck are you? I think your people skills need some work, sweetie. Jessica, how'd you like Mero's new tattoo? Well, I just wanted to let you know that since you were nice enough to give my man a makeover, I should return the favor. 
Don't worry. By the time we're through with him, Carlos will look just as handsome as Mara. Listen up, you fucking bitch. Of course, I don't have access to the same materials you did. But you know, I, I mean, I figure we can make do. When I find you... I mean, I'm sure you'll do something scary. Do me a favor. When you're scraping up your buddy's face, just remember, Mero gave you a chance to be his partner. Um, yeah, oh dear. We quickly find a human punching bag again to give us the information on where Carlos is. And we learn that he's been chained to the back of a truck shirtless and is being dragged along the asphalt. We have to hurry if we're gonna have any chance of saving him. We rush down to the docks where Carlos is and we stop the truck. And then we face this infamous cutscene. boss has to put Carlos out of his misery so he doesn't suffer any longer than he has to. There was no way to break him free from the chains and get him to the hospital in time and his wounds were just too painful. The young, naive kid that the boss had taken in under his wing has been killed by his own hands, both literally and figuratively. He didn't get much screen time, but the time he did get did make us care for him and he died in one of the worst ways possible and arguably it was the boss's fault. With the boss's petty decisions to blow up Mero's trucks and to burn his face with nuclear waste, these weren't smart tactical actions. They were petty personal attacks that didn't affect the Brotherhood's overall operations. We know Mero's end game is the shipment, the very one he offered 20% of to the boss. How does blowing up a few trucks and scarring his face impact the shipment in any way? The only reason the boss would have chosen to do these things wasn't to help the saints or hit the Brotherhood's end goal. It was purely to satisfy his ego and now Carlos is dead as a result. After Carlos' death, luck would have it that Sean D is playing this weird hippie game with her hippie brethren as she comes across Jessica, Mero's girlfriend, at the bank talking about Mero's mysterious shipment on the phone. Sean D of course promptly phones the boss to tell him about Jessica's location. He quickly legs over there to the bank and kidnaps Jessica and he gets some quick, ruthless and poetic payback for Carlos in the most brutal way possible. this do me a favor when you check the trunk just remember you should offer me something better than 20 percent what a crushing blow for mero <laughs> In all seriousness, in our pursuit for revenge, we fail to gain any information about Mero's shipment, which is something the boss later admits in the following cutscene. I think this is very telling about the state of mind regards of the Brotherhood up until now. Every single mission has been about personal attack after personal attack. Maybe it's time we actually get down to business and figure out how to steal this shipment. We head to Matt Concert, who was Miro's tattoo artist from the main mission and is a celebrity guitarist. We crash his concert, as well as crash multiple instruments across his face. Sadly, he doesn't know anything about the shipment. Miro didn't do enough to keep Matt safe, and we cripple his hand, which is a pretty extreme and horrific punishment for a guitarist. Matt didn't really do anything personal to us, all he did was give Miro a few tattoos, so this punishment seems quite extreme. Mero opts for a quick retaliation. He sends his crew to attack the Saint's turf in force. However, the police intervene, arresting both the members of the Saints and more importantly for Mero, the Brotherhood. It am um, oopsie. It looks like Mero probably shouldn't have sent his men to shoot up half the city. Mero needs his men, but he has a plan to break them out of jail. His plan 
is Altor. Remember the ultra-rich mega corporation that's taken over the old neighborhood of Saints Row? Uh, yeah, those guys. Miro storms into Dane Vogel's office, the CEO of Ultor, and threatens him with a nice gentle breeze until he promises to use his connections to the police department to let Miro's men go free. Dane Vogel probably could have, you know, not followed through with this after Miro left, but Dane Vogel is very scared and that is very scary, so we will allow it for now. Dane Vogel will become increasingly more important later on and we'll definitely get to that, but for now, he plays a smaller role. In response to Miro's men being released from jail, the boss of course quickly apprehends them once again, rather permanently this time. Miro once again carries his way into Dane Vogel's office to give his complaint to the manager over the service he received. But this time, Vogel has planned ahead. Your security guards look more like a private army. Call them whatever you want. The point is, they have big guns. However, in a cruel twist of fate, Vogel has learned of Miro's shipment and has taken control of it, appropriating it for Ultor as payment for releasing Miro's men. Because of Miro's poor decisions leading up to this point, his deal with Vogel has backfired massively, and he's lost his ultimate trump card in the form of the shipment. Maybe we should actually learn a bit more about this shipment though. We learn that it's coming in that day. I'd bet my life on it. Deal. And we quickly fly over to the boat and land, clearing out all of Ultor's security. Here, we learn what the shipment has always been about. Miro has bought a massive number of guns for his crew, which is enough to take over the entire city and put the Brotherhood on top of the food chain. I think it would actually be pretty neat if we keep these guns for ourselves. Soon after we find the weapons, the Brotherhood assault the ship in full force after we've cleared out Ultor security for them. It looks like we need to defend the ship and the guns all by ourselves. Luckily for us, we're quite well armed. After a grueling battle, we come out victorious, and the guns are now safely ours. You know, up until this point, we've been toying with Mero. Kill his bitch here, steal his money there, but I'm through play. We know where he lives, we have his guns, and I say it's time we take that motherfucker out. What do you think? It's time we assault Mero's hideout and take him out once and for all. We head down to the warehouse and begin taking out his crew in a tough battle. We begin mowing them down on every level as we climb up to the roof where Mero is waiting for us with a minigun. Oh dear. We enter a boss fight with Mero as he fires a storm of bullets at us. We can luckily use these boxes on the roof of cover as we take shots back at him. However, they do have low durability. As we bob and weave amongst the small cover we have, we win this fight against Mero. But as Mero runs out of ammo in his minigun, we enter into a fist fight and we fall and crash through the building. The shooting stop. Do you think it's over? Fight! Your little boy screamed like a bitch when we trust him up. How about you, bitch? You gotta scream. Mero has gotten away for now, but we've practically wiped out his entire crew. The Brotherhood is almost destroyed. All we need to do now is finish Mero off for good. Mero invites us into a final showdown, and we accept. After everything both have been through, after everyone who's been killed up until now, it's all boiled down to this moment. We enter the Altor Stadium by ourselves, where he is waiting for us with the remainder of his crew in their trucks pointed right at us. This is the moment both Mero and the boss have longed for. It's time to end this once and for all. It, sadly for Mero, Hyatt unlocked the RPG with the missile lock on, so he gets taken out rather quickly. With that, we find Mero in the wreckage and we finish him off for good. Any last words? Go to hell.
And with that, the Brotherhood have been defeated. I think the Brotherhood definitely showcased how much responsibility a leader has. It shows how important their decisions are for the people they lead. The boss's decision to turn down Miro's deal and go on the offensive cost Carlos his life. And in turn, that cost Jessica her life, who Miro cared for the most. After that, Miro's decision to get petty revenge against the Saints for crippling Matt's arm cost Miro his entire shipment, the main goal he has throughout the entire story. Which then led to the Saints acquiring those guns, which then resulted in the end of the Brotherhood and his life. It's a cautionary tale about the responsibilities leaders have and how their decisions can affect those they care for. And given the boss of the Saints is a new leader himself, it's an important lesson to learn. Well, that was a pretty intense storyline to say the least. But you know what? Let's just hop straight into the next one. I'm really invested now and oh I'm God, out bro. of respect points. I can't start the mission. This is an important detail I've missed out up until now, but you actually need to earn experience levels called respect, which you exchange for access to missions. So let's say you earn five respect levels. You can start five oh. missions. At first glance, this seems like a really annoying system. I mean, you probably just want to get started to the next mission straight away, but the game says no. In order to earn respect, you can earn it through a variety of sources. However, the easiest method is by playing an activity. What is an activity, I hear you ask? Well, an activity is a side game mode with six levels of increasing difficulty, with each level granting you around one whole respect. Very nice indeed. Now, these activities by themselves are actually really fun to play. Usually in other games, these activities are just a one-off thing you'll try out and forget for the rest of the game. In Saints Row 2, you have basic activities like racing, which are fun. But however, then you find the greatest sad activities in gaming history. You have Fuzz, a game show where you dress up as a police officer and <clears throat> stop people from resisting arrest. You have Demo Derby, where you get to customize your vehicle and fight against others, something GTA Online would shamelessly copy 10 years later. Very despicable. You have insurance fraud, where you ragdoll yourself into oncoming traffic for money, like, like one of those videos you see on Reddit. Bonus points if you activate the low gravity cheat, which basically turns Saints Row into that toss the turtle flash game on the internet. You have crowd control, where you protect a celebrity client by throwing their annoying stance into a multitude of different deadly objects. Finally, I can live out my dream of beating up dream stands. You have hidden fight clubs around the city. You have trailblazing, where you drive around the streets on a quad bike set on fire. I love Saints Row 2 activities. In the beginning, you'll be playing these activities in respect for the missions, but in the end, you just end up playing them for fun. Oh, what's this? I have more respect points than there are missions in the game. <laughs> Who cares about the next mission? I need to stop pirates fighting ninjas from destroying the city. Some of these activities aren't as good as others naturally, like trafficking and snatch, which are basically just boring fetch quests where you drive from point A to point B. But even if you don't like the activities themselves, you will like the rewards you're given for completing them. At level 3 and 6 of each respective activity, you will earn a unique reward. Some of these are admittedly quite boring, but more often than not, you'll get something that can completely change how you play the game. Let me give you an example. Every time I play Saints Row 2, the first thing I always do, no matter what, when I enter the free room, is complete the fuzz in the project district. The reason for this is that the two rewards you get are unlimited pistol ammo and the Cobra pistol, which is a stupidly powerful automatic pistol. When you choose to dual wield these weapons, it absolutely shreds through everything in the game, and it gives you a powerful weapon right at the start of the game that can carry you right until the end. Even if you don't enjoy a particular activity, chances are you will enjoy the rewards you receive from completing them. Whether that's a completely unique weapon that completely changes how you play the game, or just some unique outfits you want to acquire, you'll always find value in completing these activities. Oh, wait, where was I? Oh yes, the Ronin. Don't worry, father. I'll fix this. No, you won't, Shogo. You'll continue to disappoint me. The Ronin are the American branch of the larger Yakuza organization from Japan, led by Shogo Okuji, the young, brash, arrogant son to the head of the entire Yakuza, Kazuo Okuji, who is said to be the wiser, more ruthless, and effective leader. <laughs> 
Caswell is the old traditional leader who is set in his ways and doesn't feel the need to adapt to the American ways of handling business while Shogo understands America very well. However, due to Shogo not adopting the ways of the traditional Japanese Yakuza and because of Shogo's general arrogance and ego, Kazuo Okuji has a great sense of disappointment in his son. This relationship is core to the Ronin storyline and genuinely makes the Ronin a great well-written, nuanced enemy faction. But we can get to all of this later. For now, Pierce brings a plan forth to the boss and Gat to hit the Ronin where it hurts. You see, the Ronin operate the majority of gambling across Stillwater. So, Pierce comes up with an elaborate heist to steal the Ronin's money in their largest casino, using stealth, subterfuge, trickery and mind games to sneak their way into the casino and take the money without the Ronin knowing about it. The boss and Gat walk in and shoot everyone and take the money by force. Why is there a big pile of money on the coffee table? It's a little complicated. We shot up a Ronin casino and stole the cash. And you brought that shit here. After they pile the money together, they launder it. And after thwarting the resistance of the Ronin looking for revenge for the casino, the Saints gain the attention of Junichi, a high-ranking member of the Ronin with close ties to Shogo's father back in Japan. Shogo and Junichi often argue and bicker, despite needing to work together. Junichi is the perfect traditional Japanese Yakuza, whereas Shogo is a lot more Americanized and arrogant, which gives Shogo's father more appreciation and respect to Junichi, which angers Shogo, of course. The Ronin's casino was insured by Ultor, and the Ronin were hired to protect it. Which, if you remember, are the big corporation that had taken over Saints Row and built a bunch of skyscrapers on it. Needless to say, Ultor aren't happy about the Saints stealing from their casino, and they want the Ronin to get their money back. I've got my best man working on that now. Shogo phones Junichi during the meeting, and Junichi interrupts. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Like always. Cockily saying he will handle it, implying he can where Shogo cannot. In the following mission, it opens with a cutscene showing Junichi with Aisha, Johnny's girlfriend, who's been kidnapped and tied to a chair in her own home. I don't take much pleasure in this. Then let me go. If you're calm, help us find the money and do what I say. I give you my word you will live. Johnny sees that the door has been left open and quickly figures out something is wrong. Is you home? As he enters the house, falling right into the Ronin's trap, Aisha, who had been promised safety if she cooperated, sacrifices herself to warn Johnny. This was a relationship that featured more in Saints Row 1. However, even at this point in Saints Row 2, you can tell how much Aisha meant to Johnny. And despite the small amount of screen time, the writers did a great job of building them up and you can really enjoy their dynamic. From here, Johnny, who is a lot more happy-go-lucky, becomes a lot darker character from here on out, as you'll soon see. Junichi and Gap begin fighting with Ronin swords, whilst the boss deals with the other Ronin. Another Ronin member is about to finish Johnny off with his gun. However, Juni angrily instructs him to stop, wanting a fair duel, swords only, 1v1 and rust. This is pretty interesting. Junichi wants a fair duel with Gat due to a sense of honor. Yet, he had just killed Aisha, who is tied to a chair, unable to fight back. This is our first sign that the traditional sense of honor that likes Junichi and Shogo's father adopts isn't actually the most important principle they pretend it is. The hypocrisy of wanting a fair duel due to honor, whilst also killing a defenseless woman, is clear, and it feels very, very wrong. <laughs> Get out of the way! The fight concludes with Gap being almost fatally stabbed by Junichi, and before we can kill him, he gets away to safety. Right now, there's no time to mourn Aisha, and the boss calls the crew to get Gat to the hospital, with your driver taking the longest route possible because his brain cavity is hollow. We drop Gat off at the hospital and place Pierce in temporary second in command to take care of the Ronin favor. It has not been a very pleasant day to say the least. Akuji, Shogo's father, is coming into Stillwater soon, and the boss wants to know when he's coming in. Later on, Pierce gets some info from the local airport that Akuji is coming in today. We head down to the airport to take him out before he can step foot into the country. However, thanks to Junichi's intuition, he manages to save Shogo's father from the boss and Pierce. What happened, Junichi? What happened is that you left your father to die. Let me speak to him. No. What? Your father made it quite clear he doesn't wish to speak to you. Sayonara.
Junichi's strength makes Shogo look weak to his father, and the entire Ronin knows it. Sup? How badly do you want the man who hurt Johnny Gat? Who is this? Junichi will be at Kanto tonight. This is our chance for revenge. <laughs> our chance? Who the fuck are you? Is the man on the other end of the phone Shogo? Where are you going? Looks like it is. I'm taking out the son of a bitch that killed Aisha. We head down to the location Shogo gave us, and sure enough, Trinichi is there. We quickly cut him down and get revenge for Aisha. And we also help ourselves to some tasty sushi. However, upon hearing that Junichi is dead, Shogo's father is devastated. He's dead, Shogo. Junichi is dead. And all I'm left with is you. Is that so bad? It's worse than you could ever imagine. The one person Shogo's father could rely on is gone. And all he's left with is Shogo, who in his eyes is a total and useless disappointment. However, this only spares Shogo on favor to gain his father's approval. The boss heads down to the hospital where Johnny is recovering, where they have a short conversation about the events that have transpired. However, due to Shogo's desperation to finish what Junichi started with Gat, he sends his Ronin to the hospital and shoots the place up in an attempt to find Johnny. We make an escape through the waves of Ronin goons, and leave from the roof via a helicopter on the helipad. However, the conflict at the hospital has brought the attention of Dane Vogel. The lead man for all tour. You should care because I represent a multi billion dollar corporation that employs your son. Now, can we sit down? Due to their working relationship in the past and the hospital shootout being bad PR for the company, Dane Vogel wants to renegotiate the contract they have between themselves. The very contract that gives them vast amounts of money and power over the city. However, due to Shogo's father wanting to take charge over his disappointment of a son, the negotiations turn sour. My English must not be as good as I thought it was. It sounded like you were giving me an order. Mr. Rikuji, your son and I negotiated a very reasonable contract. My son's an idiot, Mr. Vogel. If you wish for the Ronin's protection, you had best be prepared to offer us something much more substantial. That's not going to happen. Then our business is concluded. Mr. Rikuji, I can't possibly stress how unwise this could- Be silent. You can show yourself out now. Well, I guess that's that. Best of luck, gentlemen. Shogo and Vogel had a very good understanding and working relationship in the past. They understood that they could benefit from one another. However, Shogo's father is the lead of the entire criminal organization back in Japan. He believes he doesn't need Vogel, Ultor or his money. The negotiations end in Ultor and the Ronin parting ways, much to Shogo's disappointment. He knows his father has made a massive mistake purely because of his own ego blinding him. But of course, he is still trying to gain the approval of his dad, so he stays silent to avoid upsetting him any further. This decision to completely remove ties from their number one source of revenue and support, the very thing that gives them the strength they have, will surely come to harm them down the line. And here we are, down the line. After realizing the Ronin have no use for him anymore, Dane Vogel immediately heads to the Saints HQ to give info on where the Ronin's main base of operations is located. I know where the Akujis lay their heads. I doubt any of your lieutenants have that information. Sean just fucked a lot of guys. Gat's talking sense. Vogel offers his life as leverage to prove his info is correct. And we drive straight over to the Ronin's hotel, in which we kill all the Ronin inside and plant lots and lots of C4 and blow the whole thing up. Okay, Akuji is a very, very stupid, silly goose. It been gone a long time, maybe I should- You really shouldn't. All right, Biz. He led us right to him. How come he went to the Ronin and not us? You were in a coma and we couldn't find Julius. Timing is everything. Meanwhile, Shogo and his father comb the ruins of their hotel, and oddly enough, Akuji seems to blame Shogo for the destruction. Don't worry, father. I'll fix this. No, you won't, Shogo. You'll continue to disappoint me. Shogo doesn't respond, but you can't help feel a bit sorry for him. His dad was completely at fault for the destruction of the hotel, thanks to his decision to end the connection with Ultor. Yet, he blames his son, who had no part to play in it. 
Shogo was in fact the wiser of the two to have developed that relation with Ulto in the first place. Akuji's ego and arrogance blinded him to the point where he chose to give up a useful ally. Whereas Shogo, despite being the more arrogant and seemingly brash at the start, was wise enough to know he needed Ultor's help. Ultimately, Shogo was completely in the right, yet he is being blamed for his father's own mistakes. However, you can only bend the will and pride of somebody before it snaps, and they choose to do something completely over the line. And Shogo was already right on the edge. May perpetual light shine on her. May her soul and the souls of all the faithful departed rest in peace. You two have humiliated my family for the last time! Leave, little boy. Look at me when I'm talking to you! Fuck off, Akuji. I'm not killing anyone at Isha's funeral. Tonight, tomorrow, you name a time and I will gladly fuck you up. But not now. How noble. Nobility is sorely overrated. Shogo's father has made him too desperate and he needs to win his father back. And the fight breaks out regardless. We defeat Shogo's Ronin and chase him down with a bike. And eventually, we do catch up to him. This isn't our place to step in. This is Gat's decision to deal with Shogo however he sees fit. Where are you taking me? Let me go! so fun when you're fighting someone who isn't tied to a chair, is it? I didn't kill her! You ordered it. I'm sorry. Well, that brings her back, doesn't it? You couldn't even let her have a burial, you fucking piece of shit. No, please. Shogo, despite all of his shortcomings, arguably didn't deserve a death this horrible. He definitely brought it all upon himself, and in some ways, it was absolutely justified. But when you look at the larger picture, Akuji is the true villain of the Ronin. Shogo was a young kid, and despite his age, he built the Ronin up to be the incredible force it was in America. And in a matter of weeks, thanks to his father's arrogance and hatred of him and spite towards his son, he has almost brought everything down and cost Shogo his life. It's time to deal with Akuji once and for all. However, before we can attack, Akuji launches an all-out assault on the Saints HQ. However, due to Akuji sadly being <clears throat> one man down, and thanks to the power of friendship and arguably, more importantly, a better guns than um, swords, we repel them and successfully defend the hideout. But, of course, Akuji won't rest for long. In the final mission, Akuji launches an assault on the Heritage Festival, which was being headed by an ally of the Saints, Mr. Wong, to kill his adversary. It feels odd that the final Ronin mission occurs because of an unrelated event to the Saints directly. However, it gives us a little more insight into Akuji's mind. He opens himself up to a massive counterattack from the Saints, who are obviously a much bigger threat than a geriatric old man, all because of a stupid decades old personal vendetta. When he was younger, he killed Mr. Wong's dog. You fucking kidding me? This honestly sums up the Ronin and Akuji more specifically perfectly. Akuji thinks he's completely in the right, and because of his honor, he's going after his oldest adversary instead of the most dangerous one. Once again, the Ronin is only being brought down by Akuji himself. We head down to the festival and mow down the Ronin on the way to Akuji, where we once again engage in an epic weeb katana duel to decide the fate of the saints and the Ronin once and for all. It's an epic duel, but sadly for us, Akuji is far too skilled in the art of the blade. However, Akuji has forgotten one important fact. 
Saints Row 2 doesn't take place in feudal Japan. It takes place in the good old US of A. Wait, wait a second. Why are we using swords in the first place? My skill. No. I'm gonna cheat. Akuji, once again, thanks to his ego and false perception of his strength, has led to his own downfall. His ideals of honour and desire for a fair fight with skill have cost him his life. The rules about honour, tradition and proving your strength in the right way never mattered and never did. All that ever mattered was getting the job done. It never mattered how. Honour doesn't matter when your son is dead because you pushed him away. Honour doesn't matter when your entire organisation crumbles with every decision you make. Honor meant nothing in the end. And with that, the Ronin have been defeated for good. Your son never should have fucked with my friends. Jokes aside, the Ronin was a story in what ego and arrogance in leadership can lead to. Akuji's feeling of righteousness and being correct led to the total downfall of the Ronin. But earlier than that, Shogo's own arrogance and ego in dealing with the threat of the saints led to Akuji coming down to America to take over in the first place and costing him the relationship with his father. Akuji's lack of care for Shogo was the core problem that destroyed the entire Ronin. Akuji wanted Shogo to stand on his own two feet, but with every knock of confidence, it was hard and harder for Shogo to do just that. Had Akuji just given Shogo the love he wanted, or better yet, Shogo realised he was right in the moments that mattered and stood up to his father on his own two feet for the sake of the Ronin. Honestly, if Shogo had the strength to stand up to his own father, his father would probably respect him more. Had either of these things happened, Shogo, Akuji, and the Ronin as a whole may just have survived. Ultimately, the Ronin storyline really is a tragedy between father and son. And in my opinion, it is the strongest written arc in Saints Row 2. Wow, <laughs> that was pretty dark. Never mind all that though. Let's spray some smelly poo on City Hall before we begin the next gang arc. The Sons of Sarmady. You know why I am here. I do. I took no pleasure in this, my friend, but a price needed to be paid for failure. The Sons of Sarmady are spooky. The Sons of Sarmady are a gang of drug warlords from Haiti, and they're absolutely ruthless. They take business completely seriously, and punishment for failure is severe. The Saints, however, are lovable goofballs in comparison. Whilst I feel the Sons of Sarmady are the weakest out of the three gangs in terms of narrative, they do offer some great fun mission design, some of the most fun missions in the entire game, and some of the best humour in the game too. As said before, the Sons control the entire Stillwater drug empire, holding multiple investments in Mr. Wheat and Mr. Black Tar Heroin's signature products. However, their most successful product they have on the market is Lower Dust, which is smoked out of a light bulb. Nevertheless, if we want to take over the entire city, we need to become the number one supplier of weed and drugs. So that means the Sons of Sarmady have to go. We begin our hostile takeover by heading down to the college district where the weeds are most likely to be smoked and steal some lower dust to reverse engineer it. We steal some supply and word gets out to the general and Mr. Sunshine, the leader and right hand man of the gang, that the saints are becoming a problem. They talk with Veteran Child in their hideout, an armoured limousine, about how Veteran Child is going to fix this problem or else. Fun fact, Veteran Child is the DJ you can actually listen to on the pop punk radio station in the game. Crank the speakers because you're going to want to hear this next track. Bass, money, fancy clothes. So it's actually pretty cool to see him as an actual person. Once we have acquired the lower dust, the boss comes to realise that he does in fact know absolutely nothing about making drugs. So they'll need to find someone who does. Eisenberg sadly died in Breaking Bad. So this lovely woman will have to do. We take a bomb to the prison, destroy the generator is to knock out the power and bring her back to the main island. Later on, she gets to work breaking down the ingredients inside the lower dust and she gets back to us. Shundi remembers that one of her exes, the figure, told her that the location of the Sons of Sarmady we farm, which annoys the boss. Shundi probably should have told him this earlier on. It would have made things a little bit more easy. But ultimately, he just leaves and goes to sort out the problem. Laura tells us that her husband can fly helicopters, and we fly in over the farm with a massive LMG to destroy the entire place, setting fire to all the weed and getting a massive buzz in the process. Eh, uh, oopsie, we may have just cost the Sons of Sarmody a quite a bit of money. The General and Mr. Sunshine storm into Veteran Child's record shop and interrogate him. How did they find out about the farm? Why don't you tell me? I don't know what- Stop lying. 
Dude, I said I don't... And he said, stop lying. Uh, I used to date this bitch Shandy, and there's a chance, I mean a small fucking chance, that I might have gotten stoned and told her about the farm. Mr. Sunshine threatens to chop veteran child's ear off and burn him alive, unless he sorts the problem out once and for all. I'll save this for later, but take note of how both leaders handle a piece of information coming to light from one of its members. Sean D hadn't told the boss about the farm despite knowing of it, and Veteran Child hadn't told the general about him giving the location of the farm up. Two similar situations, two very different reactions. Keep that in mind. Veteran Child heads to the Saints HQ, where, sadly for Sean D, the Saints have all went on holiday, and she's the only person in the hideout. Veteran Child ambushes her and knocks her out. However, immediately, the boss comes back from holiday and catches Veteran Child trying to leave. He manages to slip away with Sean D and we have to chase him down. We get in contact with him on the phone and he begins to taunt us. If you want to see Sean D again, you better come to Cox. However, as we get closer and closer to Veteran Child, he begins to panic, knowing that his life is in danger. Yeah, I was surprised too. Once we arrive at his location, we enter into a boss fight, where we have to use flashbang grenades to separate Veteran Child from holding Sean D hostage. If we try and shoot a Veteran Child otherwise, Sean D will take damage and we'll end up killing her. After a while of this, we end up killing him, and we leave the club with Sean D. Veteran Child seems to be nothing more than a pawn for the Sons of Sarmody, and despite him being clearly in over his head and not cut out for this lifestyle at all, he seemed to enjoy all the advantages of a life of crime brought, so we can't feel too sorry for him. Nevertheless, onwards we go. Jondi gives us some intel on the Sun's drug labs and we begin to blow them up. Fun fact, after this mission where we blow them up and we set fire to the drug labs inside the high-rise buildings in the projects district, fire trucks will spawn here in an increased amount for the rest of the game, and firemen can be seen attempting to put the fires out that we caused from the destruction of the drug labs, which is a pretty neat little detail. The general meets with Mr. Sunshine, his one remaining lieutenant, and asks him to fix the Saints problem. They can't afford any more failures. <laughs> Where am I? You are sitting with your betters, my friend. I wanted to see the face of the individual who had caused me so much- Who the fuck are you? I am the man whose property you stole and destroyed. Oops. Uh, who the fuck are you? They call me Mr. Sunshine. Well, this ain't sunshine. I don't care how fucked up your face is. I ain't scared of you. Oh, that other arsehole. If you please, uh, dispose of this trash. Of course, General. <laughs> You're a general? Hey, you hear that? That arsehole? <laughs> he thinks he's a... <laughs> Break out of the limo and head straight to the Saints HQ and try and defend ourselves from the suns until the drugs wear off. You know what? That, 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 wasn't that such a lovely day we had? Why you got the cheerleader calling the shots and not me? Right here. Pierce, I'll put you in charge of the Ronin. What more do you want? I can do more to help. Do you know how the sons of Samdi are still moving product after we torch their farm and drug labs? No. Then shut the fuck up. My solution is to do more than wait around for one of the 600 guys Shandy used to fuck to give us a call. There's a bunch of helicopters dropping cargo over Samdi territory. How the hell you know that? <laughs> Gotta be fucking kidding. We decided to take Pierce no on a Take Your Son to Work day to blow them up. With that, no more helicopters nor weeds for the sons. Very sad. The general meets with Mr. Sunshine once again after yet another failure, and he inflicts the punishment he had promised if he failed, where Mr. Sunshine accepts it willingly. Neither take pleasure in it, but both accept these were the rules. After this, the local homeless people of Stillwater are tweaking and itching for their fix. Yet, of course, the saints have either stolen or destroyed the majority of the sun's recent drugs. Here, Mr. Sunshine has an absolutely amazing 400 IQ idea. He will use the drug addicted bums to fight against the saints. <laughs> The 
endless horde of homeless attack the saints as they begin to safely store the drugs. After just barely making it out with their lives, they get back to the saints HQ with the drugs, where a group of 100 sneak bums like Solid Snake come to steal the weeds. We manage to deal with two, yet after the final druggy bum cops up the location of Mr. Sunshine, we give him some weeds, because we are very kind individuals. Despite Sean D wanting a bring your daughter to work day like Piers had, the boss is adamant she cannot come to face Mr. Sunshine. Veteran Child was too much for her to handle, so Sunshine would be absolutely out of her league. The boss doesn't want to babysit her and feels she'd only be a liability, which makes Sean D upset. Very sad. We head down to the location and begin a boss fight, where we must shoot his voodoo doll keeping him alive in order to damage him. After we finish the fight, we get a pretty weird cutscene. <laughs> This is the wackiest Saints Row 2 ever gets, and despite this not really being appropriate or on theme for a gangster type game, this is the only truly wacky instance we're given, so we can let it slide for the meme. At least it is pretty funny. But I mean, just imagine if we got a full game like this, that would be so horrible. Oh, 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 oh yeah. I forgot. With that, Mr. Sunshine is dead, and after taking over the majority of drug operations in the entire city, we can focus our attention on their leader, the General. However, this is pretty tricky, with the other two gangs finding their hideouts were easy. They were in one location in one building. However, the general's hideout moves. His hideout is his limo, so we asked Sean Lee to come up with a solution. So I figure the easiest way to find him is to go and tap into the traffic cameras at the police station. I don't know if easiest would be the word I'd use. Alright, so it's not the easiest way, but it's the quickest. Besides, now I get to tag along. Are you high? Or do you not remember the part when I told you I wasn't going to babysit you? Okay, so you're going to hack into the traffic cameras then? Yeah, that's what I thought. It's a small character arc, but it's good to see Sean D go from someone who seemingly wasn't able to handle herself into someone who's a critical member of a plan she devised to take out a leader of an enemy faction. Little note here, and spoilers, but in the next mission when we finally take out the limo, Sean D is there leading the charge and proving herself to the boss, which is great to see. We disguise ourselves as technicians to fix some computers, and we hack into the police's systems. We head back to the Saints HQ, set up equipment to monitor the cameras, and all we have to do is wait until the General is found. In the following mission the General is found, we see that he's heading towards the shopping mall, and the Saints set up an ambush to disable the limo. After we crash, crash, after we crash the limo off the street, the General retreats into the shopping mall, where for some reason, he has a big massive truck and a remote control minigun on top somehow. Maybe it was in his pocket. Either way, we shoot at him more times than he shoots at us, and we kill him once and for all, ending the Sons of Sarmody for good. That's it, huh? Seeing as we stole their drugs, cornered the lower dust market, took their territory and killed their leader, I'm pretty sure the Sons of Sarmody are fucked. The Sons of Sarmody are definitely less nuanced and less interesting gang than the Brotherhood and Ronin storylines. However, there definitely is some good rat to be found. Shondi's arc is pretty good, and the comparison between how the two leaders, the boss and the general, reach Shondi respectfully and allowing herself to prove herself to the gang, and then with Veteran Child, by instilling fear into him to get him to perform. These are both pretty interesting to see, and the comparison between them is quite good. However, with that, all the gangs have been defeated. The Saints are the true victors in the gang war. There is nobody left to stand in our way. Wait, wait a minute. What, what's going on? Ultra Eben. We don't cure cancer, but we sure come close. As many of you know, the restoration of Saints Row is a tremendous success, but that was just the beginning of what Ultor has in mind for Stillwater. Picture this, glass towers, clean streets, and no one below the poverty line trying to wash your car. 
Impossible? For a lesser company, maybe. Now, obviously, before we can remodel Shivington, we need to own the land. So how do we do that? By directing the gangs towards Sunnyvale. Not only are we lowering the number of our detractors, we are lowering the property value as well, which means when we buy the land, the savings get passed on to you, the stockholders. The gangs cripple each other. We direct funds to the Stillwater Police Department. They increase police presence, and pretty soon, all those nasty little gangbangers are gone. This was the plan from the beginning. Ultor has been pulling the strings. Ultor was allowing the gangs to fight and destroy the city. After the Saints cleared gang warfare from the city in Saints Row 1, Ultor allowed new gangs to rise up and take back control of the city. Even though they could have stopped them this entire time, Ultor were allowing the gangs to fight in the neighborhoods of the city so they could buy the property once the value was lowered from the increased crime rates. They were playing the Saints from the start. And now the Saints are the last gang remaining. Ultor can swoop in, buy the land they want, and kill the last remaining gang to rid the city of crime once and for all. This is what the story was leading towards this entire time. A total victory for Ultor by wielding the Saints as their weapon. attempting to take them out with brute force. However, the four just barely managed to escape with their lives. We managed to find one of the Ultor member SWAT team's ID cards, where it states he's working get somewhere called the Pyramid. Hey, Shondi, you date anyone who worked at a place called the Pyramid? No. For real? Shondi does some digging and finds out the Pyramid is an underground facility buried deep within Mount Claflin. I guess they are developing a better bread box. Honestly, they probably are. They're just, you know, developing guns and body armor too. Trundi and Pierce distract Ultor by destroying their property, whilst the boss and Gat infiltrate the pyramid and destroy it with C4. Which, of course, is a massive blow to Ultor and their bottom line, which doesn't go unnoticed by Ultor's board of directors. Dane Vogel, if you remember, was the lead guy for Ultor in Stillwater, and the person who backed the Ronin to be the gang to wipe out the others within the city before the Saints came along, has lost an incredible investment and cost the board millions by deciding to go after the Saints at this point. And the board are not happy. They threaten to fire Vogel, or worse, if the Saints aren't dealt with. But he knows better than anybody how hard it is to be rid of the Saints. They were, of course, key to his plan this entire time, of course. Vogel needs to stay at Ultor to complete his vision, and if the Saints are a part of his vision, and the only people standing in his way are the board of directors in charge of him, it's clear what needs to be done. What was this? Don't know. I found it here and it was addressed to you. Looking to crash your party? Thinking about it. Well, your history with boats is pretty solid, so uh, this seems like a good idea. I think I'm gonna go find Shandy. Good idea. The boss isn't one to learn his lesson, and heads to the boat anyways, where he promptly kills every last one of the board of directors. Dane Vogel is eagerly watching every single death from his penthouse office in the old Saints Row with a smile. The last hurdle to completing his vision has been removed, and he can operate unimpeded and consequence-free after he's used the Saints once again for his own gain. Vogel has outsmarted every character up until this point. It's only a matter of time before Vogel has complete control of Ultor, with nobody left to stop him, unless the Saints get to him before it's too late. It's time to take out Dame Vogel once and for all. Vogel has been promoted to chairman, and his project to buy up all of the impoverished property from the poorer neighborhoods of Stillwater has been given the green light to go forward from the mayor. It's time to take him out. Gat is atop a nearby building whilst the boss slowly sneaks up towards the podium. However, Vogel anticipates an assassination attempt and has a guard catch Gat in the act, forcing Gat to reveal his location to save himself and blow the assassination attempt. The boss tries to chase after Vogel. However, Vogel flees in his armored limo and escapes to the Ultor headquarters which has been put on lockdown. There is no way in. Besides one, of course. The boss grabs an Ultor attack helicopter parked nearby and flies up towards Dane Vogel's office. All of the doors have been locked. How about we open the window?
we fight Dane's personal entourage and make our way towards him. To All right, let's this not be too hasty here. Forward. You're upset, you're frustrated, and you've got a gun, which you know I'd really like it if you would put that away. You should have thought of that before you sent a team to wipe out my gang. I tried telling the board that going after the Saints was a big mistake. They should have listened to you. Believe me, right now I am agreeing with you 100%. But you have to look at the positives. You're alive. They're dead. And you have the Saints number one fan running all- We missed it. Told ya. Now pay up. Where the fuck were you guys? Traffic. What? He's not joking. The roads have been blocked off. You see Gat out there? Oh, he's fine. He's still out there killing cops. Figures. Who you calling now? Our ride. Smarters this time. Ultor used the Saints to benefit them and satisfy their overwhelming greed. They allowed for crime rates to increase, for innocent people to get hurt, despite having the means to stop it this entire time. They tried to scam the poorer citizens of their homes by artificially lowering the house market and they thought they could get away with all of it before the Saints stopped them. Ultor are an incredibly evil company and behind the mask of shiny buildings and pretty gardens and parks is an ocean of blood, sweat and tears from the suffering of those in Ultor's way. Julius wanted the Saints to protect Saints Row and the boss and his new Saints have protected the Row from its biggest threat it's ever faced. With that, there is absolutely nobody left to stand in the Saints way. The city belongs to the Saints once more, with you as its leader. Julius is gone. Gat is all that remains of the old saints and the boss has nobody he needs to answer to. Stillwater finally belongs to the saints. For better or for worse. There is just one loose end left to deal with of course. If you remember at the start of this video, I mentioned Julius, the saints old leader, forced the saints to disband after they wiped out every single gang and took control of the city in Saints Row 1. He formed the saints to stop crime in his neighborhood and eventually the entire city. But he realized all he did with the Saints was add to the problem. He didn't solve anything. One purple gang replaced three. The gang violence in Stillwater still exists as long as the Saints exist. However, after realizing the boss wouldn't back down from his life in the Saints, and if Julius stepped down, the boss would just carry on with the Saints where he left off, he had to kill him to end the gang warfare in the city he wanted to protect for good. However, unfortunately for Julius, the boss survived and he created his worst nightmare. The boss did take over the saints and now with Ultor gone, nobody is left to stop them. We can break into the police department once the game has been completed and walk into the offices to listen to free recordings that piece together the entire jigsaw. How you doing Julius? I was doing better before I got arrested. I wanted to talk to you about that. I bet you do. You've made some bad choices, but you're a good man. Let, let me help you out. What do you want? I want the saints to be gone. You can arrest all of us. Well, you guys can quit while you're ahead. If you can convince Johnny and your number two to drop their flags, the Saints will fall apart and everyone goes home happy. There's no way that player's gonna stop. Make them understand. I'll see what I can do. Several days later. The boss finally finds out who planted the bomb that put him in the coma. And of course, he wants revenge. We also find the phone number of an old member of the Saints who also shared in Julius's vision, Dex. Dex often played the role of the mastermind behind a lot of the Saints' early operations, and he was a great friend to our character in Saints Row 1. But at the end, he decided to leave the Saints and work for Ultor to better himself from a life of crime. If you've gone through Troy's files, you know that Julius set you up. Meet me at the old church and I'll tell you where to find Julius. Upon arriving at the church, Dex is nowhere to be found. The All the boss so finds in the church is a frail old man. 
One who seems you awfully ain't familiar. Neither are you. You look different, did you? I didn't do shit to my hair. You pulling a gun on me? Well, I didn't have time to plant a bomb in the church, so this'll have to do. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Why don't you educate me? I don't gotta explain shit to you. Well, this is where we're gonna have to agree to disagree. Why don't you just put the gun down? We both know you're not gonna use it. Not yet. Stop! I never thought I'd see you beg, Julius. I'm not begging. I'm trying to talk some sense into you. I'm done listening to your bullshit. Put it together. Dex wanted us in the same place. Yeah, and why do you want that? It appears Dex has betrayed them both and set them up to die. Now working for Ultor and trying to rise up the corporate ladder himself, he arranges for both the Saints leaders, old and new, to die for his own gain. Ultor's benefit is Dex's benefit, and all deep-rooted loyalties mean nothing in the face of greed. Despite the bad blood between the pair, they will both need each other to survive. They make their escape and fight off Dex's Ultor forces and flee to safety in Julius's car. They drive and fight for their lives and eventually escape from Ultor's forces, where they can finally talk one on one after so many years. Just like old times, player. Yeah. Jesus. I thought we were past this. Sh Not by a fucking long shot. Don't you get it? The Saints didn't solve a goddamn thing. Drugs were still being pushed. Innocent people were still getting killed. All we did was turn into vice kings that wore purple. Jesus Christ, you sound like a pussy. I sound like someone who's not a sociopath. You want to be the killer with a conscience? Fine. Drop your flags and write a book like King. But you never should have came after me. You telling me, if I would have asked you to walk away, you would have said yes. Fuck no, this is my city. Jesus, you haven't learned a goddamn thing. Wrong. I've learned that being in charge is better than being a bitch who keeps his mouth shut and does what he's told. Your time's over, old man. What's happened to you? I woke up. You owe me, player. If it weren't for me, you would have died on that street corner. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have been in a goddamn coma. But I guess that makes us even. Not really. Julius is dead. Julius knew the scared, quiet kid who needed to save him from the rival gang shooting up the streets of Saints Row. Julius knew his player, his right-hand man who wanted the best for the people of Stillwater. Julius could never recognize the ruthless gang leader who grew cold, harsh, and remorseless from his betrayal. He's a completely different person now, and after what Julius did to him, he could never convince him otherwise. However, the nagging question remains, was Julius right? All Julius ever wanted for his home was the neighborhood of Saints Row to be free from gang warfare. He wanted a city where kids like him were forced into gangs to survive. He may have used violent and, arguably, hypocritical methods to achieve these goals, but ultimately, at the end of Saints Row 1, he succeeded. Julius and the Saints removed all gang warfare and laid the perfect foundation for a company like Ultor to step in and take control. However, thanks to Vogel's greed, all the Saints accomplished in the first game was for nothing. Three new gangs rose up where the old ones fell. Julius knew the boss would never have backed down from the gang lifestyle and end the gang warfare on the streets. And ultimately, he was proven right. If I would have asked you to walk away, you would have said yes. Fuck no, this is my city. Jesus, you haven't learned a goddamn thing. From Julius's perspective, he was completely justified in killing the boss because he would have carried on the crime. He would have carried on the gang warfare and put innocence into the crossfire. Was he wrong to do the things he did? If we replay this final cutscene after that final mission once again, does it give you a different feeling? Doesn't it seem a little less victorious? Or does it seem a little bit more sinister? This is our city. We do well. Wow, <laughs> that was a very long journey, but I'm glad to have shared it all with you. But now, this game is over. Where did the story go in the following games? Well, we know Dex has been set up as the next big villain. So, um, how does this little storyline end? Well, um, in Saints Row 3, you become celebrities and the main villain is a wrestler. And in Saints Row 4, the Earth goes bye-bye and you fight against a, a British alien. 
Those games may be in the same series, technically, but they're not the same story. The boss in 1 and 2 and in 3 and 4 are not the same character. One is a dark sociopathic anti-hero who's remorseless in dealing with his enemies, and the other is a basic Deadpool-esque joke dispenser. People may be annoyed that the new Saints Row reboot isn't focused on our main characters anymore, but honestly, I'm glad that they aren't. At least they can't mess up these once good characters further anymore. At least they can ruin a new set of characters instead. I hope the Saints Row reboot is amazing, I, I really do. I hope it exceeds every expectation we have, but if they didn't land the Saints Row 2, a game with funny wacky moments, yet deep serious story moments is what people want, then there is no hope. Saints Row 2, in my mind, is everything an open world game should be. Unapologetically fun, with an insanely content packed city to explore, with a gripping story focused on the actual realities of living a life of crime. And it may never get the glory or recognition it deserves from the mainstream audience. It may never be seen as the pinnacle of open world crime games. But to me, Saints Row 2 is the perfect GTA game. A scratch that, Saints Row 2 is the best open world crime game. And it cannot be compared to anything else, for nothing comes close. Thank you for watching.